Hello and welcome to this installment of Very Good Christian Podcast. I am Sean Fowler. I'm Blair Davis. That's right. The two of us, were here for you, and we're glad to have you join us. I just want, before we get into the topic, to take a little bit of time to mention something very important. In the first episode, we had a blazing ball of light between us that I, as one does, assumed was an angelic visitation. And now that we have an exterior light shining in here, I'm so embarrassed, but it turns out it's just a lamp. I'm, I'm sorry, I thought it was Gabriel, and I promised Raphael during this episode, but I have failed to come through, so, so please forgive me. Now, moving on to less important things. Our topic <laughs> for this evening, and make sure you're, it's evening if you're watching this. If not, pause and then resume when it's evening. We're going to be talking about uh, a video that was released recently by Pastor Jeff Durbin, the church's, ap- I always want to say Apologia Church, but it's Apologia. Apologia? Apologia. That's how they pronounce it. Okay. And it's it's a little bit controversial. We're going to be looking at about a six or seven minute clip. And what he's doing there is he's confronting the evangelical churches that have embraced wholeheartedly what um, is, is, is known in this sermon as woke ideology. And he makes some strong points there, but he uses some interesting language to do so. And so we're going to be talking about the language that Christians use and the biblical support for the sort of language that we we ought to be using. And we're also Mm. going to be thinking critically about political movements like BLM. Indeed. And what sort of interaction ought a Christian to have? What sort of affiliation ought a Christian to have with different uh, political organizations? So... That being said, Blair, please take us deeper. So I'm just going to um, not even summarize the content of the video. You did a pretty good job of that. But I will read the post made by Apologia Studios October 5th at 3.39 p.m. when they posted this video. Um, I think that the description uh, speaks for itself in a way. So it says... Jeff Durbin confronts the woke church. Warning, this clip is not for those with commitment to pious language that would make the prophets look bad they often used worse. Pastor Jeff Durbin confronted the modern quote-unquote woke church at the recent Fight, Laugh, and Feast conference in Nashville. He said some things that we believe needed to be said. He argued that we're in a fight now. We need to say what the prophets said and do what the prophets do. Tell someone. All right. And just a little warning there, if you're gathered around the cell phone as a family listening to this podcast, as you probably do, you may need earmuffs for the kids for certain parts. Yes, this video. viewer discretion advised for this video, or for the video that we're sharing, we will not be using that coarse language in our podcast. Correct. And we do not condone um, necessarily the language used or the contents of his, his opinions here. Absolutely. Okay. Never grew up in a house with a father with a foul mouth and 
you changed the way that I spoke. You can ask for references for my family or my church body. But we have to understand that there are different speed limits and different locations for a reason. One of the things one of my heroes, Doug Wilson, says is that there's a speed limit for the highway and a speed limit for the sidewalk. They're not the same for a reason. You have to be more aggressive in the one lane. Jesus shows us this as well. We know that Jesus was known as a friend of sinners. He loved tax collectors and prostitutes. People knew it. He hung out with them to the degree that he was slandered. People were calling him a drunkard and a glutton. But put Jesus into a fight. And Jesus, when dealing with spiritually dangerous things, Jesus tells the truth in hard ways. He uses a serrated edge. Jesus calls people sons of hell. Jesus talks about people as whitewashed tombs, people full of dead, rotting corpses. You are dead. Jesus confronted people and warned them about hell. Jesus always told the truth. And when put Jesus into a fight, read Matthew 23, the meek and mild, sweet Jesus isn't there. He is confronting people who are endangering people's souls. I'll give you another example of how the prophets say things and how they do things. If you don't know this, I encourage you to get to know it. I think our evangelifish culture has lost sight of this. But this is how Ezekiel speaks about God's harlot wife. He says, Ezekiel 16, 23, And after all your wickedness, woe, woe to you, declares the Lord God. You built yourself a vaulted chamber. This is he's talking to his people. And made yourself a lofty place in every square. At the head of every street, you built your lofty place and made your beauty an abomination, offering yourself to any passerby and multiplying your whoring. You also played the whore with the Egyptians, your lustful neighbors, multiplying your whoring to provoke me to anger. Behold, therefore, I stretched out my hand against you and diminished your allotted portion and delivered you to the greed of your enemies. How sick, God says in verse 30, is your heart, declares the Lord God, because you did all these things, the deeds of a brazen prostitute, building your vaulted chamber at the head of every street and making your lofty place in every square. Yet you were not like a prostitute because you scored the payment. Did you catch that? He says you're different than other whores. Because you didn't even want to get paid. Adulterous wife who receives strangers instead of her husband. Men give gifts to all prostitutes, but you gave your gifts to all your lovers, bribing them to come to you from every side with your whorings. So you were different from other women in your whorings. No one solicited you to play the whore, and you gave payment while no payment was given to you. Therefore, you were different. Serrated edge, God telling the truth about a bride who goes and offers herself to all the pagan nations, but doesn't even receive a payment back. She's just multiplying her whorings, going out to all the pagan nations. So in light of these issues, BLM, LGBT, and the abortion issue, even jellyfish, woke pastors, you say... Homo lust is not a sin. Even though Jesus said sin begins in the heart. You say, we aren't under law, we're under grace. We don't need God's stipulated standards of justice. Yet you throw up your Marxist communist fists shouting, no justice, no peace. You swallowed the member of the Marxist denying what God says about our unity and identity in the Messiah, and you teach people that our identity is in our color. Shame on you. You deny God's own word, accusing people of guilt for the sinful color of their ancestors. Thus, you invalidate the word of God for the sake of your woke bullshit. I could do this, by the way, more Pauline, if you like. You invalidate it for the sake of your scubula. Or I think if I want to be faithful and I want to say what the prophets say 
can't do what they did. I need to be more like Ezekiel. The woke evangelical whore is a slut who lies down in the middle of a burning city, spreading her legs to the rioters and looters, spreading her legs to Marx, Engels, Alinsky, and Soros. Only she knows the history. Marxism and communism plunges nations into poverty. There's no money in this for her, but she wasn't looking for payment anyways. The evangelical woke slut is a slut whose behavior makes Cardi B's WAP look like performance art for preschoolers. Pray that God removes these pimps from the pulpit and fills it with prophets who will keep his bride pure and faithful. Let's pray. All right, there it was. There it was. Yeah, there is there is a lot to unpack with what Pastor Durbin said. Um, first off, my initial reaction is when he said, and he starts off with that, and that clip is that was posted by them separately. And it is the ending of a an hour long sermon or speech that he made. So just so everyone knows, um, they posted that video themselves, separate from the video. But we don't have the current or the the context from the full sermon going into this. Um, but he started by saying we need to do what the prophets did and and say what the prophets said. And my first question is is why. <laughs> because just because that was he quoted Paul or he he referenced Paul, he referenced Jesus and then he referenced Ezekiel which all have different contexts and different time periods. So just with him saying just that initial first sentence, I'm just wondering why he thought to say that. You know, why why even bring up, you know, why do we have to say what they said and do what they did? Yep. Um, I, I think the mindset there is that basically here, religious leaders um, and, and spiritual people, men of God in the Bible, and generally speaking, um, a, a Christian would want to emulate a, a man of God or mm -hmm. a, you know, a faithful person from Scripture. So that principle itself, I don't think, is that big of a deal. It makes sense. Emulate these um, heroes of the faith. But I, I think my question is, well, is that actually what they did? So, mm -hmm. so he he starts out this portion of the sermon by saying like, foul language is bad. It's a bad thing. I I was delivered from it. I used mm -hmm. to have a foul mouth. God delivered it from me. Although I'm about to, <laughs> I'm about I'm, to just go I'm nuts. I'm about to tip my uh, dip my toe in the water again. So let me give you the reasons why I'm mm -hmm. doing that. Anyway. <laughs> So his thing then is, let me give you examples of different people, including the Lord himself, who basically did what I'm about to do. So that's a question. The language that he, that he quoted from Jesus and the language that he quoted from Ezekiel, do you think it's the same thing as what he did? No, I, I don't. I think someone that was delivered from a, a foul mouth and then cussing kind of to get the shock value is a little, is a little different than somebody that is, um, you know, trying to wake up Israel, um, in, in the contents of what was going on there. However, um, I, I, I don't know if maybe he was looking for kind of an excuse to swear, to be outrageous in that way. Um, I, I would just wonder, you know, if you if you call yourself a pastor and you can't make this message without purposefully seeking out ways to cuss, because from from what I've read, only the ESV has the terms, you know, whoring in it, and everything else is is prostitute promiscuity, you know, words that are much tamer. So I think he could have used the same. Or he could have used a different passage even and made himself the same or made, made the same point. 
Oh, sure. But then also, I think I just don't get it because again, this this quote of saying what the prophets said, do what the prophets did. But then he quotes Paul, and it seems like he only uses Paul as a reference to justify him saying BS. Correct. And, and there's no other reason. There's no other reason for it. So it's just between between that, you know, he's um, he does these fundraising events, you know, for for these these causes that are good, but then he's just kind of the message that he chooses to put out there are cussing, and you know, in my house we don't cuss, but like you said, but I'm about to do it, so get so get ready, and you know, his kids are gonna watch that, and he's gonna be like, well. Is he supposed to teach his kids that it's okay if you're in front of, you know, a few, uh, a few thousand people? Sure, it could, you know, get, give the give the wrong message. Um, absolutely. Um, I think so. Okay, there's so many different parts here because we have the language that we use, and especially as a Christian leader preaching mm-hmm. publicly, the language that we choose to use. That's one issue here and then the other one is the the quote-unquote woke ideology is that compatible with a biblical christian faith so we have these two things going on just to um stick with the language for now there's like one distinction that has to be made and this this isn't an objective uh topic that I'm, i'm about to bring up like the answer to it isn't objective Uh, people have differing opinions on it, but Mm -hmm. when it comes to language and then this category of swear word, right? Mm -hmm. So he uses all of this language. That's pretty shocking. He's, and so he's saying like the word slut, right? Mm -hmm. Which is not a good word, but generally our, our society doesn't categorize it as a swear word. Like, like BS is, you know what I mean? Um, and, and then also, you know, he's talking about, you know, sp- spreading your legs and that sort of stuff. And, mm-hmm. and I will say, actually, in Ezekiel, there's a certain spot that he read where the e- he was reading from the ESV. It says that you, um, like, give yourself to. In Hebrew, it literally says spread your legs for. Mm-hmm. So what he said there actually is, you know, sure. it matches something that's said in Scripture. And that's that's shocking that's graphic, but in our understanding, it's not a swear word, mm-hmm. right? So where is the line to be drawn? Like, is it different? So, so for instance, with, with, with what Jesus says, Jesus calls people son, sons of hell. He calls them like uh, unmarked graves. People mm-hmm. walk over you and they don't know that they're walking over dead men's bones. Mm-hmm. That is very shocking language that's being used, but it's not swearing, right? Mm-hmm. So we have this different category. And, and, and so it's it's tough. People, you know, some have the view that when it comes to swearing, it's about the intention behind it. It's not about mm-hmm. the word itself, you know? And I'm, I tend to push, to push back on that, that the word itself matters and the intention matters. It doesn't mm-hmm. have to be an either or thing. So can, um, you know, can someone like you were bringing up, can he make this same point just as powerfully without using purposefully foul language? His point in the beginning is that, well, there are different speed limits on different roads. And so I was delivered from a foul mouth. Foul mouth is not good. But basically the point is there are times Mm -hmm. when you have to say something in such a powerful way or something, he didn't use powerful, but you have to say something in such a way that it requires foul language. Mm-hmm. And so let me give you these examples from scripture, which of course, many of them, it's like, well, they're not actually using swear words, but mm-hmm. especially Ezekiel, it's still shocking language. So mm-hmm. are there times that a Christian leader to get a certain point of, uh, across has to employ like language language? That almost scandalizes the hearer. Mm-hmm. What do you think? No. <laughs> um, I go to Ephesians 4.29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, uh, but only such that is good for building up. And that, uh, um, I think as fits the occasion. 
Yeah, that so, it may impart grace to the hearer. Yeah. And then... Um, and who wrote that? Paul. Whom he quoted as having sworn. Uh, yeah, ha- having foul language. And I'll address that in a little bit. Yeah, and then and then just, he's a pastor of a, of a church that is getting publicity, and First Timothy talks about uh, an overseer must be above reproach. So whether or not, I guess, whether or not he believes it's right, that's not necessarily giving, you know, you're still giving others a reason to criticize. Okay, so, it, it bears the appearance, like, even if you think you're justified, it de- definitely has the appearance of mm-hmm. sinful activity or leading someone astray, so yeah. you should avoid it. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of the it, same as is drinking to some churches. Some some churches, drinking is totally scandalous, and other pastors kind of talk about drinking whiskey or bourbon or, you know, different things like that. And Well, yeah, hard, hard liquor. Yeah. Although when it comes to, like, wine, we definitely have all these... It, For sure. The, the difference is that there are examples, a lot of examples of people drinking wine in scripture and you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Rather than we don't have these examples of them swearing. Yeah. You know, or according to us. Mm hmm. Um, but yeah, it talks about no filthy, no filthy talk, foolish talk, crude joking. And he wasn't joking here, but there were a couple times where he kind of smirked. And he was, you know, I could say it more Pauline, and he was, you know, like a big grin, things like that. He was just so excited to justify the cussing that I do believe it, the the vulgarity there took away from his message. And there, there are some people where you know they're mad when they swear. You know, they're swearing a bunch, and you're like, oh, they're heated about something. And there are times, you know, where I want to cuss, and I, I get so, so worked up, but I, I have... I would say, you know, God's given me pretty good control over my tongue, at least, at least with cussing, you know, there, there are plenty of times where I don't think before I speak, but I would just say that you almost, you could find yourself agreeing with him, but his approach is just so confrontational. And, you know, that's the, the title of the videos. He confronts the woke church, but I mean, sure. is, is he really that mad at the church? Again, that's. That's part of it too. The woke, the woke church umbrellas a lot of people. In his opinion, it's and and he didn't make his opinion clear. I don't think it, it, anybody that supports Black Lives Matter is woke church. Anybody who, I, and he didn't even make the distinction. Is it anyone who welcomes members of the LGBTQ community in their church? Their woke church. Is it people that have rainbows outside their church? Is that the ch- the woke church? Or, you know, he didn't. He just said he just said broadly, abortion woke church. I mean, uh, uh, abortion, LGBTQ, and BLM. and BLM, and that's just very broad. And I guess uh, just to be careful about it, it is possible that he made those distinctions earlier in the message, and mm-hmm. this was like the final, the grand, you know, the grand finale. Yeah. Where he's going to say something shocking to wrap it all together. Mm-hmm. It's possible. But if he didn't earlier in the sermon, then yes, you're correct. Very, very broad statements. What exactly do you mean mm-hmm. when you say someone who supports this? Yeah. Ab- absolutely. And... Let me let me just right now briefly yeah. address Philippians 3 and the word scubala. So I've heard this mentioned by so many people so many times. It's just nonchalantly thrown out there that, oh yeah, you know the Apostle Paul cussed, right? Mm-hmm. I've heard it several times. He said the S word in Philippians 3. Now, um, I, I mean, I, I heard that. I even heard that from a Greek teacher that I had. And what ended up happening was... Uh, in my second year Greek class for our final project, which was like a big weighty project with all these different components to it, I ended up doing a commentary on Philippians 3. That's the chapter I got. Mm -hmm. And out of the whole commentary, you had to do at least one in-depth word study. And you know what I picked. I picked Skubalon, especially because that was the teacher Mm -hmm. who claimed multiple times that it was the equivalent of the S word. So I'm like, well, I want to find this out. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping that it wouldn't be, to be honest, but uh, I still studied it nonetheless. So I'm not going to give like all of the details as to, you know, why I came to the conclusion that I did. But um, real quick, let me just read that little chunk. Um, What what the apostle is doing here 
is he ends up describing all of his, like his past heritage and his past accomplishments as a religious leader. And he compares that to the, the, like the, the worth of knowing Jesus Christ. So he says, I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, Mm. as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ." Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, scubala, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. And it's a Pauline sentence, so it's Mm -hmm. it's much longer than this. It Mm -hmm. continues to go on. And... That word only shows up once in the New Testament, but it but it's used a couple of hundred times in ancient Greek literature. And the bottom line is it's used mostly in medical writings to describe the contents of the intestines. It is true that it that it means like feces. But the question is, I mean, think about all the words we have in English for poop. There's mm-hmm. just so many slang terms and non-slang. They're not all swears, right? Mm-hmm. Like the vast majority of them are not swears, even though they're still describing the same contents, right? Mm-hmm. And so the question here is, does this uh, this word does mean feces? So Paul is trying to evoke that image, but is he doing so in a vulgar way? And the answer is no, it's not. There's one lexicon I know that asserts that it's perhaps as strong as the word crap, um, the, the BDAG lexicon states that, but I have, uh, actually all the, like so much more information as to why it, it's almost certainly not a swear word. So mm. uh, let me just say one other thing too, n- not just about this word, but keep in mind our Christian listeners that your pastor doesn't necessarily know Greek all that well. I've seen this so much. Most pastors are required to go to Bible college, but if it's been 20 or 30 years, they they probably did two years of Greek and probably didn't keep up that well with it. It's not everybody, but there, there's just enough of that situation to know that just make sure you're checking things out on your own. A lot of times it's like if a pastor says something about a Greek word from a pulpit, everyone's just like, oh, that's right. But I mm-hmm. can't tell you. Since I've come to know Greek fairly well, mm-hmm. uh, how many times, how many sermons I've listened to where there's an assertion made about a Greek verb, about this, that, the other thing, and it's like, eh, that's not really right. That's kind of wrong. And it's probably the majority of the assertions I hear about Greek during sermons are kind of off. I remember uh, you um, during a couple of sermons at our, our old church, I remember like, turning to you when something like that was said or an assertion was made and you'd kind of smirk and, and shake your head. So you're yeah. like, oh boy. <laughs> and I, tr- I tried, at first I was super hypercritical about that. I tried to be more merciful about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but this one really annoys me because you're saying, you're, you're saying that this apostle who says, don't let any corrupt communication come forth from your mouth, mm-hmm. that he purposefully dropped a fairly significant swear word in this, you know, it, in this treatise where he's exalting Christ. And Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it does, it does get under my skin and be on the lookout for, we are going to do a short video where I just, boom, I just give you all the info as to the background of this word and what Mm -hmm. it means. And uh, it's probably going to be called does, did the apostle Paul have a potty mouth? So anyway, back to this episode, (laughs) not a swear. Yeah, not, All right. <laughs> not a swear. <laughs> Moving on. Not a swear. Um, yeah, so as of the other, like, the contents, there's just, there's just a lot of confrontation there. And again, I, I will say that just in that short snippet, there's a lot of meat to what he said. There's a lot of stuff to talk about. But as we've addressed with, with uh, you know, other talks just personally, there's just a difference between... I guess having something to say and then getting the tension on you or, you know, people are going to be talking about apology, a church and Jeff Durbin and and going on their channel more than, 
you know, more than they're trying to correct their brothers and sisters in, in a church who might be following the wrong kind of social trends. Because sure. this wasn't an encouragement to correct others. And that's the issue, too, I, I think, is that, you know, Ezekiel, regardless of how you view calling someone a, a whore or a slut or a prostitute or any other colorful words, this was a warning to God's people, you know, and and it, I'm sure he he feels that he was warning them somehow, but his his speech and his language that he used doesn't reflect a caring warning. You know, this isn't God's wrath coming or anything like that. And this wasn't even a repent type of message. It was just simply, again, these Christians with this point of view are bad. And it wasn't even, here's why they're bad. It's just this language after this language, after this cuss word, after this kind of colorful picture. And it, it, it almost makes you side against him, even if he did have a good point. Yeah, um, and it's uh, the, the the final call was to pray that God would remove those sorts of pastors. Mm -hmm. And again, we don't know, you know, what was going on earlier mm -hmm. in the message. But uh, yeah, so obviously we definitely do not agree with the presentation and the choice mm -hmm. of words. But what about the content of really pushing against different kind of leftist woke sort of mm -hmm. ideology as a Christian. I mean, what do we think about that? Um, BLM. Well, I guess that's like the most recent one that's, that's, you know, making mm -hmm. the headline, especially with all of the protests. We, we, I mean, to be clear, I think we agree that we, we have, there is an issue when, you have someone like that officer who is kneeling on George Floyd's neck for mm -hmm. eight minutes, 46 seconds, I think it was. Mm -hmm. That was what, like a horrific thing, even if it was part of the protocol for the police department, which I actually think it was an approved like use of force or however, mm -hmm. we, however we describe it. But obviously you have some guy on the ground, you're kneeling on his neck like you, you know, you can't do that for that long. You have to use you know, common sense, you have yeah, to yeah. Have, have a heart. I mean, that's so, like, we, we look at that, that's a terrible sort of situation, but of course it's one instance of, and, and there there have been other instances as well. Um, I, I think of a few years ago where that, that cop uh, shot the man in, in the back who was running away from the African-American mm -hmm. man and happened to be caught by a neighbor on his on his cell phone. It looked like mm -hmm. the cop actually threw a taser down next to him while, while, when he was lying on the ground like that i'm pretty sure that um, police officer was convicted of murder i think wow. um so th there are these situations that happen mm -hmm. and those are terrible yeah and we you know we do need to th like stand against that stuff but the question is and and well uh, that that statement black lives matter mm -hmm. absolutely black lives matter are important and ought to be valued just the same as every other life and that hasn't always been the case in the united states that is true now, and, and i would go as far as to say even modern times it i mean within the last 50 60 years have been it, you know there's still improvements to be made and absolutely I, and i'm glad that you started because that was that's a difficult topic to to discuss because it's not not just because it's so controversial but yeah clearly black lives matter the live you know I, I i won't be patronizing and say all lives matter because i know there's there's heat on that but i can't begin to express you know or, or begin to identify as someone who lives in an inner city let alone someone who's a minority who has to deal with you know being kind of um looked at specifically you know there when you get this you know it's a it's a it's a african-american in a hoodie you know can you imagine how many african-americans in a hoodie there are and then you just narrow it down and they're immediately suspected you know that that kind of stuff of course you know i can't relate to that and that's it, that's got to be a terrible mindset but speaking specifically of the rioters and the looters and those who are not a part of that community who just want to burn and terrorize and harm 
I would say, yeah, if, if, if I had a pastor that was a part of any of that, you know, or marching with that, I would, I mean, I, I'd sever those ties immediately. Yeah. I, and, and I think of, you know, the organization Black Lives Matter and some of the, you know, I know there's been a lot of talk about their, some of their principles that were, at least for a period, I don't know if they are anymore, but were available on the website and some of the goals being like the, the dismantling of the nuclear family and things mm. like that. And again, I've heard different commentators talking about this, uh, but I wasn't ab actually able to find that document myself. But I do know that with this particular organization, uh, there is an adherence to what's known as critical race theory, which really is like an academic theory that developed, I think it was a professor maybe at a Yale Maybe it, maybe it was in the 90s, not that old, but it's 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 basically looking at the, the worldview is looking at, you know, interactions between humans. It's it, it's grouping people based upon their race and based mm -hmm. upon who has power. And there's the, the powerful and then the weak or it could be the 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 oppressor and the oppressed. And uh, Durbin made uh a reference to Marxism, which, which is true. Actually, critical race theory is very similar to Marxism, but instead of it being a class kind of warfare issue, it's about race. Yeah. And the issue, one of the issues with critical race theory is that it like from a Christian perspective is that it views almost everything through the lens of race. And so an individual's primary identity is in the race. Mm -hmm. And as a Christian, your primary identity has first to be as Christ's, as a child of God. It's not mm -hmm. that your your race, your ethnicity does not exist or that you should pretend it to be such. No, definitely not. But it has to be secondary or not yeah. even necessarily secondary, but it has to come under that primary identity mm -hmm. as being in Christ. That's non-negotiable if you're going to be a Christian that mm -hmm. is faithful to Scripture. Yeah, and I, I would say, too, there's a difference between welcoming someone into your church body to to be to be there i think the church should welcome all and i don't think you could you know give me a verse that would say don't welcome all you know unless there's a member that's that's causing others to sin you know um or t tearing down the flock because you do have uh i think first corinthians you know the example of the the son who was sleeping with his uh, father's wife and they kicked him out they said let satan have them and i think he came back i think there was mentioned in second corinthians or oh there is some talk in second corinthians where he references an earlier hard thing that he had to do it could be that mm -hmm. but it, i don't think it's certain but it could yeah. be that situation okay i think the example still stays though that you know that church was all sorts of wild and there was oh, this yeah. kind of this kind of one instance is singled out, and in the same way, I would say church, you know, church attendance and church membership are very different. And you know, if if someone is living any of those lifestyles, and just the the same as I think that if a woman in the past has had an abortion and she's dealing with that and still reeling from that, you know, and and coming to terms with the fact that they kind of not kind of, they literally removed a part of themselves, you know, from them, you know, absolutely welcome them into their, ch into the church. But it, then on the flip side, if you have someone that's preaching that abortion is, and, and you have some people that, you know, sh say that abortion is, is good, you know, not sure. only that it should be all right, not that it should be allowed, but that it's a good thing to kill your children. So we've, we've got to have grace, especially with people that, are of the world that don't know any better um but that is i get yeah it's not the same as um going out and and taking part in a pride parade or you know counter protesting a, an abortion clinic or again rioting and looting i i would say that's jeff Durbin would be correct in saying that specifically the pastors that are promoting those things i would say you know, if, if you're not about tearing that down or you're not about um, taking them away from their position, certainly remove yourself from 
that flock. Oh, sure. And it just, it is so important that when we engage politically and any sort of organization that might be interesting you, that you're thinking about joining or, you know, at least like posting all of their stuff and promoting what they're doing, it's important to investigate Mm -hmm. what they're about. What is their mission statement? What are their values? What are their beliefs? You have to know that if you're a Christian, if you're Mm -hmm. a Bible-believing follower of Christ, you can't just willy-nilly jump on this or that political bandwagon. You need to know what it's about. And so, Mm -hmm. for instance, you know, he he mentions LGBTQ stuff, Mm -hmm. and... That that would be something where, like, kind of like what you're talking about. We need we need to love the world. We need to love those that you know don't know Christ or you know living sinful lifestyles. But it, that's not the same thing as approving of the the sin or approving of the mm-hmm. lifestyle because that's one thing that is the accepted. Um, it's it just kind of like the common notion on the LGBT stuff is that you either are for the, the movement, which means that you approve of the lifestyle or you're a bigot and Mm -hmm. a homophobe. There is no in between. Now, of course, in reality, there is a humongous spectrum in Mm -hmm. between, but that's not recognized. And that was part of the, that was part of the, you know, political posturing in order to get through, you know, the different legislation, the different rights that, you know, this group was hoping to attain. And it, and it worked well. Mm-hmm. It's it's come to a point where in our society, if you, you know, if you utter any sort of apprehension about LT, LGBT stuff, you're labeled a bigot. Mm-hmm. And a homophobe, and people are call will call for you to be fired from your job, for you to be like deplatformed, and for all these terrible things to happen to you. Even just questioning things, like a good example is, there was there were uh, an activist group that was going around and asking different restaurants, just hypothetical, would you cater a gay wedding? And there was a restaurant somewhere in the Midwest that said, well. I believe their answer was, well, we, we actually don't cater w- w- weddings. We were like a pizza parlor or something like that. Mm-hmm. But hypothetically, well, no, we wouldn't. It, like, we serve gay people, yeah. you know, absolutely, but we probably would choose not to cater the gay wedding. Mm-hmm. So they put them on blast on the internet, and they have to close their 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 business because yeah. of, like, death threats and all that stuff. But not only that, there was a different pizza place in a different state that had the same name that they had to shut down for a while because they started getting death threats and they were they were, were posting like no 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 we would we're not the same place yeah. we we would cater a gay wedding absolutely <laughs> and but it doesn't matter because it's this crazy you know ravenous mob yeah mentality and even that sort of stuff as well just like mindlessly attacking and like if you disagree with me i i just want to destroy you mm-hmm. that sort of stuff is also something, if that's going on in an organization, that maybe is a sign that it doesn't jive with the Christian faith. That's yeah. not how Jesus told us to interact with people with whom we disagree. Mm-hmm. If you're going to love your enemies, how about someone that just disagrees with you yeah. on something? Just a basic disagreement. And, you know, it also makes me think about Jesus just praying in, in the garden that we would stay united, you know, that we wouldn't be divided, that we would that people would know us by our love. You know, all, all those kind of little biblical snippets because I can't quote the prayer verbatim, unfortunately. It's long. Yeah. It's a whole chapter. Yeah. So there's, but he does the, pray, make us one. Yeah. Make them one as you and I are one. Yeah. And that's certainly not, I mean, the world is divided and Christians, ver, you know, it's Christians versus the world. Christians this versus this. And, and I don't think that even is how we should be recognized as what we're against. But the fact that there's so many Christians fighting each other and there's so many Christians ready and waiting to say, I'm not with those, you know, those Christians are bigots or, you know, the, the quote unquote bigot Christians are the, or have to say, oh no, those, they don't represent me. You know, I'm not, I'm not like that. I don't support, you know, we're not, we're not that. So there's just so much readiness to divide. And that's not what, 
it's not even about even though all scripture is is God's word there is um extra emphasis put on what Jesus's words and so if Jesus didn't want us to be divided Jesus's prayer was for us not to be divided that like you said that we would be one as, as Jesus and the fa father are one we're not living up to that and you know regardless of which side politically which side socially you end up on we st um, our identity should always first be with Christ and 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 in that common ground and that brotherhood and brother and sisterhood absolutely and out of that place of identity out of that place of being a child of the living god you know then we begin to address even social issues it's mm -hmm. certainly not the case that we just preach salvation mm -hmm. and we don't you know deal anything with any of the social issues of this world because this world is gonna burn mm -hmm. that's not the correct mentality it is true that here and now the kingdom of God ought to bring change when God's power manifests. He changes human hearts. And we we can't separate the fact that so much, even of racism, right? Mm -hmm. It is a sin issue. A absolutely. There's this, this sin embedded in the human being that needs to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. So it's not like nothing can get better. Um, unless everybody gets saved, mm -hmm. certainly it can. I mean, we have seen progress here in the United States. Slavery is outlawed. It has mm -hmm. been. Segregation has been outlawed and redlining and things. But are there still lingering effects of those, you know, recent injustices? There are. There are still. And there are things that need to be done um, to try and, you know, bring, bring light, bring hope. Um, into you know this this darkness and I, I don't know any one group that has like you know a perfect answer to it but it's got to start from for christians mm -hmm. um it, it has to start with christ and it has to start with you know us finding our ourselves in him and working out from that from that place again mm -hmm. so not I'm not trying to say like, well, this podcast episode is going to give the answers for how to defeat racism. It's not that. It's it's more so like, listen, if you're getting involved with any sort of organization, make sure you know what they stand for, what they believe, what they're trying to accomplish, mm -hmm. and ask like, be able to ask yourself, does this accord with yeah. biblical principles? It's just very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need to, I would say, I would say I have the cure for racism. That's yeah, the, boy. Yeah false advertising no i i do think we need to find our oneness you know it, paul corrected peter of all people it's in scripture you know they had a, they had a, a confrontation of sorts um paul didn't like the way peter was was acting out and he he he, he corrected him and there's just the difference of correcting versus attacking you know correcting sure. versus dividing and I think that that's, that's so important is that just because, as you said, j just because we don't necessarily agree or vehemently disagree, you know, even if we, we are so far apart, we're just united with Christ. And there are just people that can't even be in the same church as other people anymore because they have that different opinion. And it's just, it's, and, and I, we talk about strong language and, and having to swear there's a word for me or the, there's a word that I use that is strong for me to use. And it's just the word sad. You know, when I say it's just sad, it's sad that we can't unite. It is racism is sad. You know, persecution is sad. Although, you know, for sure now I'm overusing it, but just the idea that as Christians, we can't work together for something, you know, there has to be these, these sought out ways to be divided it's unfortunate. Absolutely. Um, division, a uh, huge problem. And uh, one that was very much on the mind of different biblical writers. Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned, 1 Corinthians. That's the first issue that Paul brings up in the letter. Mm -hmm. I've heard that you were divided. <laughs> and, you know, it's it's division is one of the major evils that um, plagues the church, unfortunately. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it needs to be combated. Um, so don't let your mouth be filled with scubala. 
Sure, there you go. Look at you. Look at you. Nice. That's right. Great. Well, hey, it was so good hanging out with you and, mm. uh, you know, letting us be in your ears uh, for a little bit. And, uh, yeah, thanks thanks for joining us. You can, you know, you can like, you can hit a notification button. You can do whatever. I don't care. Do what you want. Mm. We've been very good Christian podcast. <laughs>